Welcome everyone to today's social system mapping sense making session for November 6, 2023, um, hosted by, facilitated by Lisa Negstad and Christine Capra. And then uh, Kara Martner is our technical support producer. So if you have any technical issues, um, feel free to um, uh, chat to Kara in the in the in the direct message dm her um and i'm apologize i am still oh well we're just going to do this since i can't find the other thing so what this is um this the, our monday morning sessions is it's a, a vision about a possibility the possibility that social system mapping can help uh support a shift from systems of dominance to systems of connection uh, it's a learning opportunity for all of us to learn how to do mapping together better, an opportunity to contribute your own experience and insight into this learning because it's a, all, we're all learning together. None of us has all the answers. Um, it's a community of practice. There are a number of us who frequently get together to, to think about these things. And then not today, but some days we we use, we go into our social system map. So it's also a relationship with our social system map. And if any of you are not on it, I invite you to do that. Kara will put um, links in the in the chat at some point to, to facilitate that. So um, today's objectives are that you come away with a sense of the potential that we're inspired by, that you meet some cool folks and feel welcomed by, and by them, and that you're at least a little bit curious about how social system mapping can support a network in learning how to deal with complexity and you see how we can um, explore useful frameworks to understand their underlying fundamentals. So for today's agenda, we're gonna do some introductions and framing. We're gonna um, have a, a little breakout for you to get to know each other. Lisa is gonna um, present and lead, a conversa uh, lead us in some learning about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, as well as human systems dynamics, stances of inquiry. Then we will go back into the same breakouts and um, and have some conversation about that. This this agenda, I copied and I didn't edit it clearly because there's no more theory after that. Then we'll go, anyway, I have too many items on the agenda. So let's just pretend you don't see that. <laughs> so for those of you who I, I'm, uh, you know what I forgot to give all of us? Kara, I have to stop this for a second is the link to voting in, um, where's the voting link? I've got that, Christine, I just put it in the chat. Oh, thank you. Okay, so we will be inviting you to put, um, back to presenting, to share some info, to, to share your thoughts and to put, uh, do some introductions in um, in Mentimeter. And so Kira just put a link in there. And if you have that, I'm trying to share my screen again. Um, so if you would put into, if you click on the link to Mentimeter and go in and like Lisa just did, put in your name, pronouns and location Oh, and a network that you're supporting in some way. They can all go together in one field so we can see who's working on what cool, important initiatives that have to do with networks. I'd like to see where everyone's calling in from. Evan and Tom are on the East Coast. So is Rebecca, Sebastian is in Berlin, and Anna's in the UK, Amy, Lisa, me, Kara are all in the middle of the country, but we have a north-south split. <laughs> and then I know Mary's on the west coast. Let me see if I can find them. Okay. So yeah, so that's on the East Coast too. And Mary's on the West Coast. So thank you for that. I'm gonna to go to the next um, question, which is 
Share one big challenge that you experience in doing collaborative work in networks. If, if you feel so inclined, it's this is all invitational. This is all within our willingness and capacity. There's no pressure to share more than you're comfortable with. Building sufficient buy-in to use the same tools together. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, chronically interesting one. Moving beyond a one-time evaluator depiction. Yeah, getting users past the shiny object phase of seeing a network map and actually seeing ourselves. I'm hoping you're all able to um, also see the responses or toggle back to my shared screen to see see each other's responses. Yeah, okay. Um, some of these are about mapping, social system mapping in particular, and some are about the larger um, larger issues of purpose and shared um, buy-in of tools, et cetera, and engagement. And as we're going through our session today, let's think about how communication, how our um, interactions in groups together, how we, in other words, essentially how we talk to each other, um, either uh, supports the being stuck in the challenge or supports breaking through some of these challenges or finding new solutions. So what, today we're going to talk about communication. Um, and again, I'm... so just uh, um, uh, 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 to, to get to know um, where everyone's at with just a quick poll, how familiar you are with social system mapping so that we're all, um, we're not, we know we're not all as, e we're not equally familiar and that's good because it's good to have new, new questions, new ideas. And we just want to have a sense of the ratio. Okay, and it looks like we have looks like we have no one here who has no idea about social system mapping, so that's great. Um, so uh, quickly, what social system mapping is? I think most of you have been in, uh, been through this, but social system mapping is essentially I like to call it a mashup between a social network map, so the social relationships, the connections among people being the foundation, the core. Um, the 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 thing that everything else hang, hangs on, but so there's it's it's the foundation of it is social network map, but includes things like assets, concepts, um, strategies, system systemic elements, stakeholder differential, stakeholder uh, perspectives, etc. Um, and and so it's very similar to any of those kinds of maps that you may have seen you might you know visually it's especially similar there'll be dots and lines connecting them so you may look at it and think oh, i've got this you know this is familiar i know what i'm looking at but um uh a social system map is different from any of those kinds of context or kinds of maps because it um it, it because it includes all of these dimensions and it also is um is dynamic over time so it uh, it's a lot more um, it's a lot more dense in terms of um, content. It's a lot richer. There's a lot more ways you can sort of interrogate the data you have, and so that makes makes it a little bit more challenging because it's not a thing that you present once and then you move on from, and you you just you know have some high level expert here are my learnings and now we're gonna move on from. But how do we keep it, keep it alive and help others learn how to access it and make get value from it? Um, are the, very different from our a typical, any one of these maps. It's online, interactive, and accessible to everyone in a network. It's iterative, emergent, dynamic. And so we like to think of it as an ongoing collective practice. It's a process more than it's a product. 
and um and so how we how we introduce that that practice into our networks is part of what we're all working on learning together so why do we do social system mapping especially if it's a little bit um cognitively challenging um the the reason is to support systemic transformation so when we're doing our when we're thinking about social system mapping methodology or when we're teaching people or when we're practicing it out in our networks we are the point is to support a global movement that's already existing that you're all working on in one way or another to shift from systems of dominance exploitation and extraction to systems of connection reverence and regeneration and so when, one of the things we've learned a couple things we've learned in the last 20 to 30 years as um, complexity thinking and network thinking has um, become more a part of social change efforts is that to support systemic transformation we need strong networks of wise, wise change agents so strong networks is a big piece of it and wise change agents are the other big piece of it so i like to talk about this in in terms of two fundamental shifts that uh feed into this larger shift from dominance to connection one of which is the relational shift so this is um, um building trust this is the network weaving part of going from a separate self to a more porous a more aware of others and and then ultimately a more interdependent and connected self and this means connected not just to other people but to the planet all the beings um, etc. So this is a very different way of understanding ourselves and being in the world. And so social system mapping is trying to help support that, as well as what I call the cognitive shift, meaning we can be as tight a relation a network as we want, but if we're not uh, approaching things from a complexity and systemic perspective, we're not going to be as effective as we could be because if we're still in a what what uh, a mechanistic worldview, and we're not getting more dimensional in our understanding, more open and interconnected, more complex, and ultimately having a living systems or complex systems worldview, we're also not going to be very effective because we're not really going to know how to interact with the system in a way that is generative and, and helps to shift. So those are sort of two different ways of looking at the same thing. So the, but you know, people can say, well, really, really, they're the, they're the same thing. Why are you, you know, separating these out into two different, uh, talking about them into two, in two different shifts? And um, just this week, I realized, oh, I've, you know, we've been talking about it, this, you know, just how, what way we look at it uh, really impacts what we're able to see. And, and if we only look from one angle or the other angle, um, which is our tendency as humans, we tend to either look at it cognitively or look at it relationally um that e both both approaches obscure things and make it harder for us to see possibilities that we would see if we were practicing looking from each toggling back and forth from both angles sort of perpetually and just this week i was talking i was thinking about it again and i realized oh i'm just, we're just talking about the heart and the head you know so the one is the you know the heart approach and one is the head approach and what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring them together so that they are strongly connected and that we're using both we're not just saying oh i'm just going to be you know uh just love everybody without any kind of wisdom about you know how they fit into the system and how i could be interacting with them differently and i'm not going to just be all in my head about it either so connecting up the head and the heart is really what these two shifts are about in the service so connecting them up in the service of systemic transformation so social system mapping we think is this is why it's can be challenging why it can be slow for people to really understand the value of it or to adopt it is because it's messy and it's working on both at the same time um but that's that's what social system mapping is trying to support so this the theory for how this works we call this our i'm going to share what we those of us who sort of designed this graphic call our transformational vortex is so we start out with a, a group of people on the ground they might um they might 
they have something in common, they have some system that they, uh, some kind of change in the world, a systemic change that they um, want to, to, to create. They might be, they might be coordinated, they might not, they might be aware of each other, they might not, but they have some kind of thing in common. That's where this all starts. Um, and then some group of them or all of them start to realize that if they were to work together, if they were to be more coordinated, share resources, share their learning, et cetera, that, um, that their efforts would have greater impact in the world. And can I, no, I just don't like this. There we go. Uh, go away. No, anyway, sorry about that. So, um, that, that, that they're, hang on a second. No, that's not what I want. Okay, that little thing is just going to keep bump, popping up because I can't figure it out right now. Um, that if they were more coordinated, their effects would they would have more effect on more more impact on the systems they're trying to change. Their their efforts would ripple out. So that's what they're looking for. At some point, some some subset of um, of this group decides to take on responsibility to create a network. So this might be. Um, uh, sometimes it's academics doing a research project. Sometimes it's um, it's staff of a of a nonprofit or it's staff of a foundation who decide to support a network. At any rate, and sometimes it's just people on the ground who um, feel so strongly about the potential of this network that they decide that they're they're going to take on the work of making this happen. So they start to talk with each other and plan together and think together about how to do this. And so this is this. So they're starting their own relationship building. This orange swath in our visual nomenclature here is orange is the relational shift. So they start building relationships with each other. Eventually they start convening, doing convenings with the people on the ground, help it making introductions of people that they think um, could support each other in, in, in good ways or um, you know, give each other new ideas. It, might be convening around topics, et cetera. So they start doing this relationship building. And at some point, this group uh, that has taken on responsibility starts to realize that they would like to know more about what's going on. They don't, they would like to have a better sense of who's connecting with who. And if their work is creating more connections, they would like to know who's part of which piece of the system, who's, um, who has what assets or what expertise or what lived experience to share with the rest of the network. There's just a lot that they realize that they can't just see just by looking, just by having a convening. Um, and, and so they start to envision something that whether they have ever seen a social system or map or not, they start to envision something that we would say, would, would say, well, that sounds like you need a social system map. Eventually, they come across social system mapping if we're all lucky um, and the stars line up and they decide that that's what they want to do is have us is create a social system map. So in an ideal world, these people here would include as many different perspectives on the ground, as many different people on the ground as they can in designing the social system map from the very beginning. Um, we understand social system mapping as every single piece of it every single step of the of the design or implementation or sense making process is an opportunity to bring people together to build relationships to build shared understanding across so even just you know deciding do we add a particular question to a survey or not sometimes some questions are really a slam dunk not a big deal but some of them actually can be a prompt for a valuable dialogue across differences within the network that actually help people um start to understand each other better or start to think differently, even if we never put that that question in the survey, it can be a useful dialogue prompt. So we see every step as an opportunity to have sh shared understanding and shared discussion. But, and so we would like, in, a, in an ideal world, we would like to start with as many people as possible in our initial design of a survey so that we can get as many different ways of understanding the world represented, different perspectives represented. But the truth is, um, especially in these days, everybody's stretched. The people that you probably would like to be, you know, your main informants and your main design partners often are both the 
you know, the people that everyone calls on. So they're just way overworked. And often there is a, a understandable suspicion about data gathering, surveying. People maybe have survey fatigue. They maybe have you had, you know, been researched in ways that are that are damaging and have some mistrust of this sort of tool or this sort of process and don't want to put their energy into it at the beginning. So how we handle that is we just say, just get started because until people have something to interact with, something that's relevant to them and connected to their work, it's very hard. It's very abstract. It's very hard to get people to, to understand what you're trying to do. So get started doing the best you can. And so this group in our little evolution will make a survey. They will get as much input as they can, but if they can't, they will do their best given what they already know of the, of the systems that they're trying to change and the network that they're trying to build. They'll create a social system map. So the social system map will gather data from these people on the ground. It will go into a map. Um, the map then is available to everyone, everyone in the network, everyone on the ground. And at first, generally, it will be these people, the core drivers of the network, the core guardians will use the map to do relationship building. Off in the beginning, it's not usually the case that these people jump in and start using the map, um, but it, it immediately can be uh, useful for the core members of the, of the network. But as we start to share the map and share learning of the map and tell stories of, you know, we, we've had this convening because we could see from our social system map that a lot of you were interested in this or a lot of you were facing that challenge or whatever, we then um, will start to get input from people. They'll say, oh, you know, my worldview is not really well represented here at all. Or I find the, that, that those words triggering. Or, you know, there's this whole realm of thinking that you've left out. Or why is it just all about your expertise and not about who we are as humans or whatever it is. They'll, you'll start to get feedback. You can take that feedback and revise the SumApp data gathering tool, and which then creates differences in the map. Then you can explore those. You can then be saying, okay, we have new info and let's dig into this new info. And what does this mean to us? And what is it telling us? So the data itself starts to get more aligned with the purpose of the network and the in the in the specific context of the network and you know more people are starting to pay attention to the map or find it interesting this turns into sort of a i mean the the goal of the core people is is to use this as a feedback loop so we're learning we're adding things we're share we're sense making and we're just sort of going back and forth with changing the map and using the map and having all of it be an opportunity for conversations and shared learning and so we're building more relationships more people are using it and then the data is slowly getting even closer to the core purpose and close, you know, more aligned with the context. And then this purple swath is the, con the cognitive shift. So we're starting to actually, by using the map um, together, sense making with it together, people are starting to actually see the network as a system, see how that network as a system fits into the broader system and start to think more in terms of interconnectedness, not just among people, but among strategies and skills and resources and power and privileged positions within a system. So we're starting to, we're, we're increasing our comfort with complexity and our insight into complexity and our capacity to um, process and think that way. So that's the purple shift. And then that informs our map some more. And eventually in our transformational theory of change, it, you know, the, the purple, the cognitive becomes a main driver because you now we have even more curiosity and more questions and more ways we wanna think about the things and the data gets more aligned. And then in the end, um, I would not say that any network has gotten to this point, but given the theory and what we've seen possible up to so far, is that then eventually we get to a point where the relationships, the systems thinking or the context or the needs and the processes and the data of our social system map are all aligned so that they're all, you know, sort of going towards the same thing and helping deepen our insight. So that's 
our introduction to social system mapping, what it is, how we think about it, and how we wh how we think it it works, what our theory of change is with it. Um, welcome, Ma, uh oh, you you may have to correct me, Mish Mish Mishanda. Welcome. Just want to acknowledge you your presence, and and invite you if you would like to. If I said it said your name wrong, if you would like to correct me, um, but don't feel like you need to do anything, but I see you've unmuted. You said it absolutely correct. So I have to honor that because a lot of people do get it wrong. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Hopefully I'll do it again, right? <laughs> uh, okay. But welcome. Thanks for, for joining us. Um, okay. So now we're going to do some uh, breakout groups in, we're going to, Kara's going to put you in rooms, probably has already prepared to put you in breakout rooms of three with a mix of people that uh, show up all the time and people who are new to this context. Um, we're gonna spend five minutes and just share your, again, the things that you put in the intro, the your name, your location, the network you're working on, um, and then um, your experience level with this context. Are you someone who's here every Monday or is this your first time? And then any, you know, it, 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 so you'll have five minutes and then just, just connect and get to know each other um, until we come back. And then you will, we will have uh, another breakout session later on in the, or another breakout later on in the session and you'll be with the same people. So, um, uh, so be prepared for that. And if it was horrible and you don't want to be with that same person again, then let Karen know and she will <laughs> come up with a solution because we don't want you to uh, feel uh, obliged to be in a context that you're not comfortable with. But Hopefully everyone is very comfortable with one another, but we don't know that yet. So let's go ahead and go. Kara, are you ready to go into the breakout, put them in breakouts? I have a housekeeping question because if the number of people are here, we either have two groups of three and a group of two. Otherwise we would have two groups of four. Do the two, the three and the two and not the four. You got it. Excellent, then we're all set to go. Okay, see you all in five minutes. Welcome back. I'm gonna, okay. I'm just going to, now that I have found the slide that I need to be on, I'm just going to hand it off to Lisa to talk uh, about our topic today, having to do with communication, and I'll, Lisa, let you take it, take it away. Thanks, Christine. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Nagstad, and I'm on these sessions in and out and part of the community of practice in and out as well. <laughs> I'm based here um, in, in Minneapolis and have been working with social system mapping for a while now. I um, So when Christine and I were preparing for today's session, we wanted to focus on kind of the how we work together in networks. And we're, I'm especially connect, wanting to connect it back to the, the two shifts that Christine talked about that we're, we're working on, the relational shift and the cog cognitive shift that we need to do in our social systems to, to shift from systems of dominance um, and extraction to, to systems of um, to generative systems and systems of connection and regeneration um, and reverence. That's the other word I'm looking for. And um, a little bit different than some of the tools we might use for sense making, we actually want to explore in that relational shift some tools that might be useful. Sometimes we talk about how important inquiry is, asking these open questions as we work together as a network and how that can be difficult, <laughs> how our own brains can get in the way and um, how do we really make that shift to a true stance of inquiry. So there's two tools that we're gonna introduce and kind of work with and you might have you might be familiar with both of them and um, use those as we think about the, the these communication practices as we build relationship in our networks. So the first tool that we're going to work with is the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And I think you can share now, Christine, the, the slides. And I'm also curious if any of you know John and Julie Gottman's work, Gottman Institute. If you do, um, you can either raise your hand using the reactions on the bottom of your Zoom screen or just indicate somehow, give me a thumbs up or something if you've seen these before. I've found them really useful in working with different collaborations and groups and teams. 
And um, it actually, okay, so I'm gonna give you a little background of John and Julie Gottman's work. They are psychologists who have studied um, behaviors in um, actually mostly in marriages. <laughs> and they, um, I think it's, I think it is John. I don't remember when Julie came on the scene because they're partners and she, he, she started doing work with John. But um, they, they studied newlyweds. They were able to observe their behaviors with each other. And there was a, um, a study where they were able to predict with 96% accuracy whether those newlyweds were going to still be married 15 years later. And what they discovered was if they were engaging in any of these four behaviors on a regular basis in the relationship without doing repair bids, without acknowledging, having self-awareness that they were doing these behaviors and finding ways to interrupt them and repair, they were too toxic for the relationship. And I found this, I find these really helpful in my work with organizations and groups and networks because they are so very, very common behaviors that we all do. <laughs> so what we're trying to do is also not be judgmental uh, in ourselves about doing this, but creating the self-awareness of that. And as we think about the relational shifts we need to make in collaborative work, a lot of it is about starting with our own self-awareness, where we are. And especially if we get really emotionally activated, these are core behaviors that we can quickly go to. Um, and so, sort of using this as a framework to to do some practice with and looking at and then also what's another um kind of way we can work with these if we're starting to notice these in ourselves what are ways we can interrupt it so that's the second step we'll do so let's just take a moment to do to have some interaction in the in the chat um you can open that up and you can separate it out from your main zoom box if that's easier to see what people are writing and we have a question for you as you kind of, well, let me actually just explain what the four behaviors are. I've listed them here, but maybe I'll go through a little bit more explanation of them. So the first one is um, a judgmental criticism. So that's when we're being critical of who a person is, right? This is different than kind of academic criticism of something isn't working and we're looking at something, but it's actually, we're getting very personal in the criticism. So we're being judgmental. Um, contempt, which is that disdain or scorn we can feel for another person. Defensiveness is when we are in an interaction and we have make it all about our own feelings in the situation. So oftentimes defensiveness becomes about explaining or I need to justify <laughs> why I did this. Um, and just feeling defensive, especially this comes up when we're when we are disagreeing about something or giving feedback to each other about something. It's easy to get defensive. And then stonewalling is that refusal to engage, right? Um, it looks like the silent treatment and just checking out <laughs> of the interaction. Um, so those are just kind of brief descriptions of the four. I'm going to ask Kara first to just put in just two resources, two resource links if you want to explore more about these behaviors. Um, there is some uh, additional background for you. Can you uh, open them up on your computer or um, look at them at some other point, but just so you have those two. And then just let's start to kind of explore these a little bit more in a more interactive way here. And let's start with, let's just, I'm going to add right in here too. So a safe place. It's okay to just explore these because we all do. So the first question is, what do you notice about which one you might most default to? Sometimes for some of us, it's like two that are our favorites. And just put that in the chat. Like if you are noticing you're getting most frustrated with your group, the, um, your network that you're working in, um, what, whatever, whatever, configuration, right? If you're part of a smaller group trying to organize the network, if you're part of the broader network and you're in a collaboration, or you can just think of team, a team that you're part of, um, what do you notice about which one you default to? Like for me, often um, I would default to defensiveness and criticism. I kind of pick, go between the two, <laughs> my first behavior. So go ahead and just put those in the, um, in the chat. So just to to be noticing which one. And then once you 
kind of think about which one you might default to, I'll have a second question for you. Yeah, and other people can often identify <laughs> quicker for you to like Sebastian put in here. Um, and the, <laughs> Christine, I do the first three, depending on what's going on, that's what, right? That's so true. All right, these are great. Let me start with, let me do a next question, which I don't have on the slides. And, um, cause I'm just, I'm, I'm switching it up in the moment, Christine. So we'll just ask this question in the chat. What, what's most likely for you to have this behavior? Like, what do you notice? What situations set these behaviors off for you? Like for me, defensiveness, I often get defensive one where I feel most critical about my own work, like I feel like, oh, maybe I didn't do very well at that or where I feel most self-critical is when I get defensive. Also, when people don't have the full picture and they're criticizing me and I feel like they don't have the picture. These are just examples of it. Like curious what kind of what happens, what do you notice about when you're most likely to have one of, you know, be engaging in one of these behaviors? Yeah, Christina, I love, I get defensive when people tell me how this community of practice could be better. Right, exactly. Yeah, and shame is really one that can easily put us into any of these four. Oh yeah, these are good. Or yeah, funding or authority. Power is an interesting dynamic in here too, of um, thinking uh, like when power is introduced or there's differential in power, how we can have these different behaviors. Yeah, like this, like when uh, this is interesting. Right. <laughs> Like Tom, I, people know where I want them to go. I know best. That's so I can so relate to these, all of these. All right. There's more work coming on us and we don't know. We don't agree with the reason or we don't sometimes know the reason why. Yeah. Power imbalances for sure. Yeah. When people think they know what's best. <laughs> okay. So you can see also. This is one thing that happens is this, if one behavior starts in your group, um, it's so easy. It just goes, so you can see this difference, like someone saying they know what's best. So they, they can be judgmental and, and have that judgmental criticism. And then, and then Christine's responding, I get contemptuous when people think they know what's best. So you get one going, like a criticism going and you can have contempt or defensiveness on the other side. Okay, so here's my question for you about what is it? No, just think about the one that you're my, maybe is your most favorite to do. What does it feel like to be on the receiving end of those? Like, kind of, what do you notice in yourself if one of these is happening, especially towards you in the dynamic or just in the in your group? What does it feel like to be on the receiving end of any of these? Yeah, this is, yes, keep going here. And you can see how it's often an emotional reaction that then puts us into one of those behaviors. Feels deflating, super annoying. Yeah, confidence loss for sure. It feels, I mean, I, I think that at its core is hurtful. Um, it, it's, it is feel, pers it does feel personal and like, I, like, Someone's trying to hurt me. Misunderstood. Yep. Losing hope. Yep. So another question for you is, okay, so I love how just how self-aware you all are showing on this, because I think that is, like, that is one of the things that Christine and I talk about a lot is this, this if you're really trying to shift these systems that we're in, these really strong systems we're in, how much self-awareness it takes for us to notice what's going on with ourselves and then and then doing that interruption. And then um, a lot of, we, we get really good at masking these behaviors as well. So I'm curious, um, this is the next question I have for you. What are ways you see these behaviors get masked? I've been, um, I've done all four. 
<laughs> in a masked way. Like it's actually behind it is actually judgmental criticism or behind it is actually defensiveness. I'll give you one example to get us started. I often use defensiveness, defensiveness or I see it in teams as providing detailed explanation, right? If someone is saying something, it's like, no, I if I just explain this better, you'll understand, right? <laughs> this is something to be critical of or that this is, so yeah, let's keep trying here. Um, let's see what's in chat. So ways that these behaviors get masked. Masked. Yeah. Judgment turns into schooling, mansplaining, lecturing. Yeah. Oh yeah, information sharing. Yeah. And giving up, right? Just like I'm not sure what to do next. Like uh giving up ownership response or kind of a responsibility for the groups overall any other ways right and then there's these systemic approaches that are kind of normal ways of working these patterns we just are so used to language yep language just yep sh yep content turns into shutting down and checking off and rambling huh yep So, so both of these are both things we can see happening and also things we can notice for ourselves, right? That we do to mask behavior. You know, one systemic thing that has um, been pointed out to me and um, I, I think it's worth noting as we look at systems that, of oppression that we work in that so, sometimes when I'm in groups and I've been sharing this work, I'll have BIPOC people tell me some of these are actually a privilege to even exhibit in a group, depending on the power balance in the group. So for example, they'll say stonewalling is, is, is often the one that BIPOC people will go to because it's safer than if they were acting out in contempt or criticism. And it's not as safe when you have a power differential with sort of traditional systems of oppression. So it's interesting to kind of think of it on that level as well. Yeah, and rambling is what dominant culture people will do yep so um so we have this um helpful helpful work i think from gottman <laughs> um and how do we do repair bids it's, and it all starts with the self-awareness piece and then we go into a second tool that we wanted to mention today that can be helpful is how do we interrupt when we see this happen so Again, we have to start with ourselves if we're noticing. Um, and often it's bodily, like I'm really stressed. Often we're getting out of our sort of regulated state and we're getting our brain really um, triggered into anxiety or stress or anything like that. It's easy then to, to, to go into one of these behaviors more. And then there's also just, if we see others going into this, what are ways we can interrupt? So, Let's um let's look at a second the second tool we wanted to offer today as a kind of a place to consider that. And actually, let me just say a couple more things here. And also curious about what questions or thoughts you're first having. Um, sort of thinking about what am I attending to and where am I getting stuck? and that ability to notice our thoughts and feelings. Um, and I'm curious for all of you, what, what are ways that you notice that for yourself? Like what are ways you're most likely to be aware of both what's happening to you internally um, as you're also participating in a group or a, a, a team? Um, wondering if, let's just do a little uh, reflection on that in the chat. Kind of what do you most notice for yourself? And Kara's doing a great job of capturing these questions of <laughs> just come up with them at the moment here. Um, curious, this question, what do you most likely be aware it's happening internally while you participate in a group or team? Hmm, Pulse, yeah. Excellent. Tightening or relaxing. 
Mm -hmm. Disassociating, heart pounds. Yep. Jaw clenching, anxiety level, right? Thinking about the spot, that's for me too, the spiraling thoughts. I can't like get that focused in on what's happening. It's just, mm, yep. Get quiet, withdraw, face gets hot. Yes. And I like how you're pointing to both like noticing what happens and then what you can do at, to shift it. Um, I think a lot of somatic practices, sort of body connection with this can be really helpful. And the more groups get comfortable with that mix and blend of being okay just sharing it with the group too. I think it's gonna shift some of those systems. Like it's okay to be vulnerable and share. This is really stressful for me right now. And <laughs> I'm noticing this in my body. Does anyone else notice that? So a lot of, um, there's this uh, combination that really helps me when, especially when I'm facilitating groups, sometimes I use my own reaction too in the facilitation, but it's notice and inquiry. So I think shifting um, some of the systemic shifts we're trying to do is interrupting what might feel like a really strong force in one direction happening in our interaction. And if we notice in our own bodies, like in these different ways that happens for us, or we just notice the group tension happening that we're able to stop, notice that, and then ask a question. Um, Often what I'll do is say something like, I, I I felt like it got really crunchy in here. Does anyone else feel that? Or I'm feeling kind of anxious right now. I don't know if that's just me or is anyone else feeling that way? Um, and, you know, I, I feel like it's one of those things that we all have to find our own language for that and what makes sense for us to say that feels authentic. But the shift is the noticing and, and we start to shift it. Like we're not just staying in that one groove of communication or interaction. So the second tool we were going to introduce in the how to interact is these great sort of either sometimes we call them practices or a stance of inquiry that we've learned in human systems dynamics. And I'm wondering if you want to share that slide to see. Can you see it? We're, yes. Yep. That's it. So you can see how some of this actually relate directly to some of the be some of the four horsemen from from Gottman. So it's turn judgment into curiosity. So if we're starting to hear those sounds of like I can't believe you know whatever it sounds like to you judgmental criticism I can't believe they did that I can't believe this right like they're so this <laughs> whatever that those those phrases are that indicate to you oh I think I'm being critical here judgment what let's shift that to curiosity. And it shifts our stance on it. Um, and often what I discover, if I can do this in a moment, I can't always catch myself, but if I can in the moment, then what I can do is often I just learn this whole other aspect that I didn't know about, right? Because so much of judgment is telling a story that we have made up for ourselves. And if I can shift it I, 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 and ask a question and get curious, it just expands like, oh, I had no idea. And then um, this one is a disagreement. If we really do have a different view or different perspective and difference is one of the key factors we learn in human system dynamics where the energy for change happens. And we have these in our networks so much, but we have to be able to work with difference. And so shared exploration, really exploring each other's perspective um, works in that for that. And then defensiveness, when we're really feeling like we're having to explain or justify, or we're feeling vic victimized, um, we turn that into self-reflection. And often it's what actually is true here that I'm feeling ashamed about or hurt by. Um, but that's often, um, for me at least with defensiveness, what I have to explore. <laughs> Where am I actually um, being most critical of myself? And then these assumptions and the questions, that's where we're trying to interrupt these stories we tell ourselves um, into uh, actually asking questions and expanding our kind of pool of shared meaning. Understand, Seth, it was, it was great to have you while you were here. Understand that you have to leave at the top of the hour, so thanks. 
Um, just curious what, how all of the, these two tools are landing for you right now. And then we'll do a little breakout um, session with think, kind of thinking about these in our smaller groups. But before we do that, to learn if there's any thoughts or reflections or Christine, do you want to start us off? Do you have anything to add in there? Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I'll just say this has been so up for me for the last couple months, just like the ways that we conversationally, um, keep ourselves stuck <laughs> and, and, and block ourselves from moving forward just by the, the ways we interact, um, has been so up for me. And so it's been, so like Lisa and I had this great conversation a couple of weeks ago and and at the moment, my mind is is like so full that it's blankish. So I'm just gonna say, uh, it 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 feels to me like I, I have got I've worked in networks a very long time and 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 worked with this kind of thinking for a long time. And it feels to me that if we can't solve these problems, I don't know how we're gonna solve bigger problems. Like we have to learn how to hear each other and connect with each other across our differences and across our histories and our stories and our and our fears um it, if we if we want to change the larger systems it's the it's fractal and this is the 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 tiniest piece of that change and um so that's all i'm i can say at the moment but this has been great and so you can you can go to the next and lisa yeah I'm, I'm just curious what others think too i mean this it's it's is the being willingness to get being willing to engage in the messiness of what it takes to shift this and, and that is that fractal level that micro level if we're being willing to do that here like if we're being willing to be vulnerable and say oh i realize i just felt really defensive there um i didn't mean to uh let me stop let me hear what you say again <laughs> right and then and any of those little minor shifts then we'll create bigger shifts in the system that's an interesting point. Oh yeah, um, so others, what are you thinking about this? How's it landing? Speak, speak out, Lisa, or would you want us to share in the- Yeah, no, go ahead and speak in the room, especially. Uh, yeah. Like what is one of the biggest impediments um, for, for inquiry is um, a unproductive uh, emotional stance, which uh, I would, like the first one that would come to mind would be anger. So how do you turn a stand of anger into something constructive. I don't need to speak about love, but you know, something that moves us towards. So are you commenting or asking? I'm, I'm <laughs> commenting on what I just saw and yeah. I'm yeah. reflecting upon what's happening in the world. And if you have so yeah. much, uh, you have so much uh, uh, outright hate, um, yeah. Everything else that comes afterwards is a nice, a nice to have, but you will not overcome it un, un, until people um, overcome their their outright hate. Maybe we, next time. Yeah, Lisa, I want to. I just want to. I I think it's really important for us to distinguish between hate and anger, and I think mm -hmm. that not all anger is is unproductive, and I think our learning how to cope with anger in productive ways is is highly valuable because I, I don't I don't I don't think we can make change without the energy that comes from anger, but that's a different thing from hate. And I, so I, I totally think hate we need to we you know we is is a is a problem. But anger that hasn't been processed and hasn't been learned turned into something into energy for change becomes hate. So I think when we, we, we need to be careful when we say just not to give people the impression that we think anger is a bad thing because that encourages us to push it inward and then it does become hate. So I, we need Thanks to clarify that. Absolutely agree. Yes, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, we have, we didn't really do kind of behind the, what, what's behind driving these behaviors. And yeah. it's, it's our neuroscience and emotion and, um, you know, I think that is a whole area to explore too. I mean, what we're learning about neural networks in our own brains and how they connect to everyone else's neural network, I think is fascinating right now. 
And if we can, if we're willing to kind of try to recreate our own neural network, it's going to affect the rest. And so, but that, that is, the, I think that's another way of saying what you're saying, Christine, is like being able to work with the anger in a way that we're being responsive to it and using it versus being reactive right out of it or getting kind of stuck in that. And I feel like the neuroscience, we're learning a lot of neuroscience right now that's helping us with that as well. So yeah, so should we go into some breakout, Christine, right, right now or should we, um, what do you think? I was just wanting to see if there's anything coming up for anyone else that they wanna contribute before we go into breakouts. Let's give people a moment. Yeah. Amy. I'll offer Lisa that this I when she went through it, it's like, oh yeah, I've I have heard them interviewed before. So I had yeah. been exposed to it. And I think for me, but I think just what's occurring for me right now is I am a very self-reflective person. And so I'm I think for a while, I mean i I watch myself. I don't always get it right, but I'm just very aware of Amy. But what I'm, um, what I am, I feel like the growing edge for me is to be aware of these dynamics in a group. So I get to facilitate. I love to facilitate. I love to work with groups. And I, I've thought of these things that you're sharing as more about me. And I just need to, you know, make a better Amy and be more aware. But so I'm just really intrigued by stepping into this knowledge in a way that lets me be a better facilitator and a accompaniment partner. So thank you. Yeah, it's a, um, yeah, <laughs> I can just relate to that as I work with groups. Um, so yeah, being uh, able to just be okay with just sensing something and having the group help define what might be happening there. Um, or we might actually see one of these explicit behaviors happening and we could we can say that, but it's more about having the group start to see itself. So one of the one of my backgrounds is systems view of teams and the more um and sort of the more the group gets intelligent at seeing its dynamics happen like that that's where we have some of that sh shift happen too. But oftentimes as a facilitator, first of all, often I need two facilitators because I feel like there's so many layers to see just as one. And you have, because of what you have going on in yourself too. Um, but inviting the group into doing it with you. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. I, I, I hear what you're saying for sure. Can relate. <laughs> Lisa, I want to, I just want to draw a, a connection and then, and then maybe we could go on our breakout groups, um, okay. which is this, what we're talking about right here is not social system mapping. We, I mean, we're like, it doesn't show up directly in a map. And so you might say, why are we talking about this in a group that's about social system mapping? And for me, the, the, the core of this is that if we're gonna do mapping, we are bringing a mapping culture to a network or to a community and a map, any kind of, a, a map can be a tool for dominance and, and it's easy to turn a social system map into a tool for dominance. And so if we're serious, and I certainly am about mapping being used for shifting from dominance to connection, that means that we have to be carriers of a culture of connection and reverence and regeneration. We can't just show up and behave in our stereotypical old world dominant systems communication ways and think that we're going to make a map that breaks through that and, and that helps create a shift. So we have to start in ourselves becoming carriers of this culture. And so for me, they're not directly related, but they're indirectly related. And it's very important that we're capable of holding a mapping process in a complex, connected, regenerative way. And not just bring a process in that is a top-down mechanistic process and think that we're going to do much good because because I have plenty of experience that tells me we're not <laughs> that it will fail and so mm -hmm. that's that's why we spend a lot of time looking at our at at our mindsets and our culture as well as the actual process and methodology of mapping is because what we're trying to do is create a culture of of transformation 
and become cur curious of that. Um, okay, and, and I'm done. And maybe, Lisa, we could go to do 10 minutes of, looks like we lost Mishanda. Um, 10 yeah. minutes breakout. Yeah, and, and Kara, do you have those questions that we're thinking about to do to reflect on in the breakouts? I do. <clears throat> I think okay. sometimes we lose those. I'll put them in the chat now and then again after we yeah. open the rooms just in case. Okay. I'm just curious about what the rooms look like. I can't They're a little different. It's going to be one of three <laughs> and one of two, I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. And then uh, timing? 10. Yeah. Ten. And just pick, or, you know, what, uh, if some of these we already kind of talked about in the full group, so just pick whatever questions kind of feel for you or where you'd like to go with the conversation too, that's fine. So Lisa, um, we want to just leave a few minutes for Rebecca to make announcements, even though she has already done it in the chat, but, but it's a mm -hmm. habit we're trying to get into is to leave space. <laughs> oh, good. And, um, uh, and, and usually we say five minutes, but you can, you know, five minutes is maybe a little more than this. Anyway, but what do you want to do with the next five minutes? I think just curious if anything kind of came up in your conversation that would be good to share with the whole group. Any discoveries or insights? I'm just unmute and speak in the room. I can tell you that what happened in our group is that we realized, as we were talking about how this session is an hour and a half, and some people have to leave in an hour. And all three of us had quite different story that we were telling ourselves about why people have to leave in the hour versus <laughs> staying for the hour and a half. And we're like, oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> all three of us had very different stories. So it's like, okay, what can we, it's like turning assumption into questions. <laughs> what could we ask <laughs> those who have to leave at the top of the hour to discover what really is the story? <laughs> And probably a different one for each of them, maybe <laughs> we would. So that was one of our noticing. Anything else for for many of you want to that you want to share with the group? And and it needn't be positive. It need or it could it could be a crumble. <laughs> it could be a, a tension or a difference about how we've held this. So feel free to just share whatever. Or maybe or maybe you talk about something else <laughs> that would be helpful to share with the group. <laughs> in anything maybe we just go to announcements and wrap wrapping up christine what do you think i'm just waiting one more minute sometimes something is just barely beginning to bubble and you haven't exactly found the words and you need another 30 seconds to find the words and that's when the person changes the subjects <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I like to just give us. I like it. I can change too quickly. Uh, I can too. So, so let's go to announcements. I will say I find I, the comment feature in Zoom so helpful for that. Right, that when I have that delayed reaction, I can still jot down a note. And remember when we used to meet with people in rooms together, and we didn't have that. <laughs> So there's some stuff that's better about Zoom, I think. <laughs> anyway, so next Monday is the next on-ramp session. And I think people still have in the, the chat, the registration link. Ah, and Kara's re-entering it. Thank you. And, and then uh, the following Monday, I think that's Thanksgiving week for those of us in the U.S., is the deep dive. Oh, yeah. Deep dive. Good way to start that week. Is that right? I think we I think we'll not have a deep dive. Because oh, because you you're that's right, because you can actually take a whole week off. And I was thinking I had to plan a deep dive and I had an idea and everything and I was gonna prepare for it, but well, I well not have another thing to give thanks for. Yes, you can set off. And so we have on ramp on next Monday. Christine, is there anything else you'd like to say about? On ramp, I tend to think of it as a chance to get a kind of learn more, get an introduction that's still useful for many of us who have heard variants of it over time. Anything else you wanted to say about next Monday's? I'll just say so. Usually, an on ramp is 
someone in the community who has been working, who has created a map in a in in their own context in a network that they're working with. Um, so someone, just someone with a map shares their map. So they share the the context, the purpose of the network, and then they walk us through their their map as it stands. Sometimes it's a very new map, and they get feedback from others and the, like suggestions they could ways they could do visualization. And and often it's just um, they share, and the rest of us ask questions. And the purpose for that is so that because it's really hard to understand social system mapping without looking at some maps. Number one, and number two, we're all doing it in different contexts. And so when we hear from different, you know, different people in different contexts, we all get ideas about things we could do differently. And we learn more about ways it can be useful. And also we just like to get to know each other and get to know each other's work and have a better insight into what's what's going on in, in everyone's world. So it's a very hands-on, very introductory, very applied kind of a, um, of a session, especially good for brand new people. But our regulars show up for it all the time. And next week, I don't have anybody um, lined up to who has a map that they're able to share. One of the challenges of on-ramps is that often maps are private. Social system maps are often private, and so we can't share them. I have a whole lot I would love to share, but I can't. Um, but so I don't have one lined up for next week, and so I'm going to do. I'm going to. I'm going to walk us through the human systems dynamics map dynamics practitioners network map because it's a good map. It's publicly available, and um, uh, it gives us something to talk about and interact with. So that was more probably than you were expecting, Rebecca. But but that's the the in scoop. Yep. Yep. And then um, I don't know if Sebastian and Anna, if you're on our map and if you would like to be or not, but let's have um, Kara put a link to putting yourself, if you want to be on our social system map for our community practice, just as a as an opportunity to interact with the interface, if nothing more, um, or as you know, part of becoming a, a member of this community practice, whether peripheral or more central remains to be seen, but at any rate, um, you can you can use that link called Join Community Practice Map, and it will take you through the the interface, and we will see you, and uh, then we might reach out to you <laughs> for various purposes. Um, yeah, I don't have anything else to. Lisa, is there anything else for you or Rebecca? Rebecca, are you complete? Okay, I see Rebecca's complete. Okay. Well then, how about if we just do? We have a little. Uh, uh, we would like to be developing more little rituals to share our culture, but what the one we have so far, aside from now, Rebecca making announcements, is um, our goodbye ritual, which is we don't like to like when people just jump off and haven't gotten the proper goodbye. We I feel a little incomplete and a little bad. So uh, when it, when we it is time for us to close, we take a moment. Um, we all unmute ourselves. If you're willing to do this with us, I'll count down. Once we're all unmuted, I'll count down three, two, one. And when I get to one, we just all together at the same time, give each other our blessings, greetings, good wishes, whatever. And so then we have a little bit of shared closure. So if you wanna participate, here we go. Three, two, one. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great week, everybody. Have a wonderful week. Thanks, Christine. Bye. Bye. Good to see you all.